everybody. Welcome to uh, the middle of the school holidays. It's springtime, there's sun in the air. Sun in the air? The sun's always in the air. But uh, it's, surely it's gonna warm up at some point in Jesus' Name, we're praying for that. Um, I'm really excited about this morning. Last, last week, we, we looked at the, the dwelling place. We looked at the seven key sort of dwelling places that God uh, has put within the Scriptures that exist from the beginning of time to the very end of time. Um, and uh, I got about halfway through that message. So we're, dry, we're diving straight back into that today. But before we get into there, I wanna read a message from Ben, our, our youth pastor about what's going on right now. There's, there's about 120 uh, of, our, of our youth and young adult leaders and, and parent helpers at Milo Baptist Camp having time with God and with each other. And this is what he sent me last night. He said, tonight was another level. God has been on the move so significantly, youth praying over each other. We prayed and worshiped for three hours together tonight. Many tears, many young people opening up their hearts to God. Holy Spirit is moving powerfully, youth responding and a special sense of family. How good, hey? How exciting is it what God's doing? I was there Friday night and it was great. Pastor Danny Guglamucci preaching a powerful word from Isaiah 6 and I'm just excited about what God's doing. So why don't we stand to our feet and let's just pray over our youth and young adults for today and tomorrow on that last day of camp and entrust them to the Lord. Lord, thank You that You're a good God. Thank You that You are the God who longs to dwell with His people. And we pray, Father, that today there would be Your protecting hand upon that camp, but um, just continue to move. God, my prayer for the last few weeks for this is that our young people wouldn't just have a moment, uh, but You do a work that becomes the monument that becomes the thing that they look back on and they know because they know because they know that You are real, that there is an enduring faith that is planted, that this is uh, the beginning of a journey, uh, not even the high point, Lord. It's just a solid foundational truth that gets hold of them uh, and changes their life. So bless them, Lord, and um, continue to move, we pray. In the precious Name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Awesome. May I be seated? Uh, just another real quick update. Uh, next week, um, where Trav Weezy, as Leona said, is bringing his testimony. This, you do not want to miss next week. I don't care what you've got on. I don't care what's planned, whether you're going to South Africa. <laughs> cancel it. <laughs> it is going to be a phenomenal time. Trav, for those of you who know Trav, a very, very powerful story of uh, of pain, suffering, but, the, but God working in that. And it's gonna be a time you wanna bring your tissues. Guys, bring your tissues, but it's gonna be an amazing time with God. So don't miss that. But when He's here, I'm gonna be at Mount Barker Baptist because we're starting a church-wide series between Mount Barker, Verdun, Allgay and, the, and Lobethal. And we're gonna be preaching into the book of Nehemiah. So I'm launching that at Mount Barker. And then on the 23rd, Nick Tui, so Mount Barker's senior pastor, will be here preaching that same launch message here. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's gonna be an exciting time. Um, so strap in for the next couple of months. God is on the move. I said to our staff just the other week in our staff meeting, I said, we're not gonna just cruise into the end of the year. It's not like, oh, Christmas is coming, let's just gently just cruise. No, no, we're pressing into the things that God has for us and believing for immeasurably more, for baptisms, for salvations, for God just to keep doing His great work amongst us. Amen? So, so good. Go to the book of Hebrews for me. Hebrews chapter 10. It's serious today. I've got the big bertha out. They've got the big Bible. So it must be serious. Hebrews 10 from verse 19. Um, and I just realised, Joe, that I'm reading from the ESV. So my wife, Joe's on the, on the computer today and I've stitched her up within the first five seconds. Sorry, babe. 
Hebrews chapter 10, you can read along in the NIV. I'm gonna read from the ESV. It says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain that is through His flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Everyone say, draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful, yes? And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day draw near. Lord, bless Your Word, we pray. Speak to us. Thank You that Your Word is alive and active. And Father, thank You that it's Your Word that does the work, not my charisma, not my gift. It is Your Spirit that does the work. And so may I get out of the way. May we just enter into your presence and see you rightly and have our lives radically changed. We pray in Jesus' Name and all God's children said, Amen. So last week we looked at the the dwelling place, this idea that God from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is trying to communicate with humanity that His goal, His purpose in creating is to dwell with humanity. That is why He said, let there be. (laughs) That's why He created to dwell. God is looking for a dwelling place, a resting place. It's what the number seven is all about. This seventh day rest to have the eternal, the, the transcendent encountering the temporal in this powerful way where we dwell with God. And so that was his created ideal. That's the Eden ideal. That's what Eden is all about. This beautiful relationship, uninhibited relationship with God. Can we put Eden up there? We see this this unadulterated intimacy between God and humanity. And then we talked about how but that, that broke because of our own sin and our selfishness. And so... For the rest of of Scripture, basically from Genesis 3 onwards, is this picture of God pursuing us. And God has put all these, these moments in time, He's put these significant special dwelling places through the pages of Scripture and history to bring us and to point us to that Eden ideal, which He is saying, this is what I'm about and this is what I'm gonna bring you back to, right? So we talked about Sinai. We talked about that picture that we see the people at the, at the base of the mountain and that there was the elders who, who came up and then we saw that Moses and, and Joshua sort of enter into the cloud and have this incredible dwelling moment with God. And on the mountain, Moses sees heaven, like he sees the eternal dwelling place and he gets so overwhelmed by it, so overawed by it. He, he, he sees this pattern of, of how God dwells. And then he gets that pattern, he says, right, now we've got, to, we've got to institute that on the earth. And so he comes down and he draws that pattern out and we see the tabernacle. And we see this because in, in Exodus chapter 25, God says, see that you make everything according to the pattern. Everyone say pattern. Everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So he gets this pattern on the mountain and we saw the tabernacle. And then uh, we saw that fast forward through time and David has this encounter with God in the, in First Chronicles. And we see that he gets this pattern. He sees this image. And so he starts to develop these plans. And he says, Lord, I long to build you a dwelling place, a resting place. Like it was on his heart. And God said, uh-uh, it's not you. It's your son. And we saw the establishment of Solomon's temple, this dwelling place, which looks an awful lot like the tabernacle because there is a biblical pattern. 
And then we saw this temple which, which the people would worship God. And then we see Christ and Jesus uh, being God dwelling with humanity and he, His declaration that He is the temple. He's the fulfilment of the temple. He is the holy place. He is God dwelling with us. He is the priesthood, which means He's the, ho- he's, he's the holy of holies. He's the holy place. But He was also sacrificed, as it says in Hebrews, outside the gate that He's the altar. <laughs> You know, He is the fulfilment of the temple. And then from Christ, we saw as He was crucified and He was raised to life and glorified, ascended on high and He sent His Spirit to establish His church that we might be a dwelling place, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. All those passages, don't you know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? The church is the dwelling place of God drawing people back to that Eden ideal, pointing people to this beautiful reality that God wants to dwell with His creation. But it doesn't just end there because Jesus also comes to the Apostle John in a powerful revelation and gives him a picture, which is a pattern of the New Jerusalem, which in Revelation 22 is titled Eden Restored, which looks an awful lot like Eden in Genesis 1, Genesis 1 and 2. And so what we saw in Scripture, these seven dwelling places which speak to that reality and each one shares a pattern. And the more you explore it and dive into it, they share the same pattern, a pattern that reveals not only in the moment how humanity can dwell with God. Like we saw the tabernacle and the temple and the sacrificial system and all of it saying, this is how you can dwell with God, how the eternal and the temporal can connect that the temporal would know it's made for the eternal. That existed in that moment in time. Yes, but it was more than just for that moment. It more than just had that purpose. It also carried a promise of this is the means by which God would abide by that pattern so that the new Jerusalem would come, so that we, He would fulfil that Abrahamic promise of dwelling with Him. That's my summary of a 50 minute message last week. That's where we got to. What we didn't get time to look at, which I'm really passionate and excited about, is what does that really mean for us right here, right now? What does it mean for the church, for for us in this moment in time? And here's the first thing I want us to understand. What it means for us is that the pattern still remains, just that the means of access has changed. You should write that down. The pattern still remains, but the means of access has changed. If the pattern is a heavenly pattern, an eternal pattern, pattern by which we access God's presence, it means the pattern never changes. Moses caught the revelation of heaven. Heaven hasn't changed. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. Jesus fulfilled the pattern. We're gonna see this in a second. The pattern hasn't changed, just the means of access has. Which means for us, we need to explore this pattern. We need to be a people who are learning and growing and catching the vision and understanding this pattern, understanding what it means to enter the presence of God and how God has ordained it. So come with me for a second. Just just jump in with me for a second because we have to understand that patterns bring peace, right? Who here loves order and organisation? Who's a little bit more like me and doesn't necessarily froth off of the idea that everything has to have its place? Look how, look how few of us there are. <laughs> the reality is though, is, is order, like a lack of order brings chaos. We know that, that's true of creation. It's true of, it's true of Genesis 1 when there was order and there was chaos, there was there was. You know, the Spirit hovered over the waters and that waters speak of that tohu vavohu in Hebrew, which means uh, chaos and wild and waste. And God brings creative order. God establishes a creative pattern, right? 
And we all need to abide by that. In our family, we have, um, we have this thing that we do in the car where we plug the phone in and we play, we play music, right? And everyone gets to pick a song in time. We were talking about this in our small group the other day. And we were in the car the other day and it was time to like, can we, can we listen to music? Sure, no worries. And so uh, Mabel went first. And this is, this is the song that my beloved Mabel picked. I'm just gonna play this on my phone and hope that it, uh, and put it through the mic. So we jump in the car, Mabel picks, picks a song. And this is the song that she plays every time without fail. I close my eyes, but she's still there. Wait for it. Isn't it beautiful? And so we sit in the car. Mabdi's like, yeah, it's a great song. She's, so she'll sit there and we listen to that song. We're all sitting there just having this beautiful moment with Beauty and the Beast, just encountering that song. And then what happens is that song comes to an end and without any sort of complaining, without any sort of hindrance, Mabel just takes the phone and just hands it into the back seat for Benji. Benji takes the phone and he plays this. And after five seconds, I turned it off. No I'm kidding. We we listen to that whole song and then it's Bailey saying without any complaining, without any sort of frustration, after Mabel rolled her eyes and looked at me as to say, Oh my goodness, Dad, what are we listening to? <laughs> Benji hands the phone over to Bailey, and because Bailey was raised right <laughs> in the knowledge of good and evil and he's walking the path of righteousness, he played this song. Come on. We got the power to win. The power to move. And on, and on it goes. And then the phone gets handed back to the front and off it goes. Now, the reason I tell you that is because two years ago, when we tried to implement this, this idea, that didn't happen, right? What happened was one of them said, can we play a song? The phone went on press play and the back seat became, let's call it pandemonium. (laughs) Arguing, complaining, I don't want to listen to that. And I wanted, and then it was like, my turn, my turn. Now it's my turn. And it was just chaos because there was no order and there was no pattern. And over the course of a couple of years, we've established this clear pattern that the phone goes around the circle in a clockwise fashion within the car, each person plays their song in its entirety, in full. There is no complaining, there is no worrying because you'll get your turn next. And in establishing the pattern, all of a sudden when we play the songs, there's peace. How many of you with children have been in a car where there's no peace? How many of you with children who've been in a car where there's no peace have pulled over? It's not fun. (laughs) But there's something beautiful about being in a car with a family when there's just peace and cohesion because a pattern produces peace. And it's true in the Scripture. That's why it works for us. It's because God is the God of creative order and He puts patterns in place. In fact, creation is built on pattern. There is gravity at 9.8 metres per second per second holding us. There are laws in place that God has ordained because He is the God of creative order. Now, creative order doesn't mean there's no freedom. It doesn't mean that if I step slightly this way, I'm out of God's will. We forget that in the garden, it was a garden and there were trees and goodness everywhere, yes? And there was just, just one tree. Sometimes we think it's like, you're not allowed to eat from anything. You can't do anything except for this. But no, it's like go through the narrow gate, through Christ is the picture. And there's this beautiful garden to enjoy. And because Adam and Eve, their sin was that they forgot that there was the fruit of the garden. 
their temptation, they, they got an apple, but they lost a garden. And we have to remember that there is Patterns, within patent, there is freedom, there is grace, there's joy, there's this, that's how God is. There's free will, there's choice. It's beautiful. I, I even pre like Joe's on the slides today, and we're putting the notes in, it's just like, what's coming next? Like, what order are we gonna have? I'm like, well, I don't really know that. Because I preach from a pattern, like I don't just sit there and have the notes that I work through. God gives me a pattern, He gives me a picture and then we preach from that. And that means sometimes I'm gonna say that when it might've been said that, you know, it's, and it might frustrate people who love the pattern. I love the order and structure and everything, but we preach like there's beauty in pattern, there's freedom in pattern. But God is the God of pattern. There is structure and there is order. It's true for creation. It's true for so much as you read His Word. And it's especially true for the dwelling place. It's especially true for how we encounter His presence. And this is what the book of Hebrews is all about. You see, in the book of Hebrews, the author who we don't know who it is, is talking about sacrificial Jewish worship patterns. And for nine and a half, nine chapters, ten and a half chapters, he's unpacking the Jewish law and he's talking about the fulfilment of all of those systems, the sacrificial system. It's an incredibly detailed, amazing book. And then when we get to verse 19, he says the word, therefore, When you hear or read therefore in the Bible, you ask, what is it therefore? Because it speaks to what's come before it. And so it's talking about this pattern. Now now picture it, Joe, can we put the temple up there? Picture it for a second. You are a Jew for a second. Jump in with me. You know I love to do this. Jump in, jump into the context, all right? First century Jew, the temple is there. You're used to worshipping God a particular way. And so what happens is you're ordained in Scripture that you enter the courts with thanksgiving and praise. And so you come through the door, you come through the gates and there's joy and there's thanksgiving and there's celebration and there's all these Levites all around the temple, all of them. And they're they're gifted in music and they're gifted in song and they're dancing and they're declaring the goodness of God. And so you walk in that space and you're like, oh, there's some energy in the house because they're singing the goodness and the praises of God. And then you enter and you have with you your sacrifice and you, you bring your sacrifice and you bring it to the priest who would be standing in a spot that you're not allowed to get to and he'll take that sacrifice and he brings it to this altar. This is our altar today. I actually wanted to have this on fire, but it turns out you can't have fire in a school gym. <laughs> Who would have known? <laughs> Wisdom prevails again. And the priest would take out of all this joy and all this festivity and all this noise and celebration and the priest would take that sacrifice and all of a sudden what began with laughter and happiness, (laughs) there's a solemn reverence that comes as you become viscerally aware that the penalty of sin is death. As the priest would take your sacrifice would take the lamb that you were bringing on behalf of your sin and he would slaughter that thing and offer it on the altar. And then the priest would jump in this huge basin which you can see up there and wash, to wash the sin away symbolically. And then the priest could then go into the inner place and perform the the ritual duties. And once a year, only once a year, the high priest could bring that sacrifice behind the curtain into the very presence of God, the hotspot of God's presence, encountering God in His fullness and bring that uh, annual sacrifice on behalf of all the people of Israel. 
And this is what you are used to. This is what you know to be true. And then all of a sudden there's this guy, Jesus, who comes along and he starts telling you that he is the temple. And Jesus happens to enter Jerusalem with people singing and praising and shouting Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And then Jesus happens to die upon a cross outside of the city gate, having his blood poured out for the sins of humanity. And then Jesus says that he enters into he, 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 he dies and He rises again and now He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Why? So that we could do the same. But come back to Hebrews because Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfil it. So as we read, it says, therefore, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, Confidence to enter into the holy places. He's saying they, they still exist, spiritually speaking. The holy place is still there. The very presence of God is still there. But we now don't come in this temporal temple built by human hands. We come literally into the very presence of God. How? Just because we can know we come uh, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened up for us through the curtain, that is His flesh, His body. So Jesus in, in laying His life down on the altar, we know from the Bible that the curtain was torn in two. He's saying that He literally became the means of access. So the pattern hasn't changed. We come with joyful celebration, praise and worship. We come with reverence and awe. We come to an altar, we'll get to that in a second. And we go through Him. It is by grace through faith. We come through Christ. When people say there's many ways, no, 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 there's not many ways to access the presence of God. There's only one because the pattern hasn't changed. He didn't change the pattern. He didn't say, well, you can just get in however you want to. He goes, you've got to come through me because I am literally the curtain. I'm the fulfilment of everything the Old Testament talks about. And in me is freedom. In me is not just rules and rituals you have to follow. No, in me is freedom and joy and hope and the fullness of God's presence, which is everywhere, which is glorious and wonderful. But you've got to come through me. The pattern hasn't changed. Just the means of access, which is available to everyone by faith. Because He's done the work. This is why church looks the way it church, church looks the way it does when we gather, why we have singing, why we have celebration, why we enter with thanksgiving and praise. The first few songs are always praising Him because we're following the biblical pattern. It's why we'll have a song like we did today about Calvary. It's we declare the, the sacrifice of Jesus, why we wanna leave with celebration because when your sins are forgiven, there's a joy in your step. It's about following the biblical pattern. But what does that mean for us? If the pattern still exists, what does it mean for the church? You're like, great, Dave, great theology, love it, thanks very much. What does that have to do with me? Here's the thing. First and foremost, what it means is that the church fundamentally is a movement about the presence of God. The church exists to draw people to the presence of God. Hear me, we are not fundamentally a social justice movement. The church is not a social club movement. The church is a presence movement. We exist to draw people to the very presence of God, to a place of encounter. And out of that comes everything else. Out of an encounter with Christ will come a heart for the vulnerable. Will come a heart for the poor. Will come a heart for the widows. Will come a heart for justice and mercy. All of that flows from an encounter because if it's just about the work, we've missed the finish work. 
But when we come to the finished work, then the work of the Gospel and the work of the Kingdom will overflow out of us. It will become evidence of what He has done, not a work by which we try and gain His approval. Are you with me? Like my life, when I got saved, I, didn't, I was someone asking a lot of questions, right? You know, I was raised in the church and I had my questions and I was saying, God, why, why, why? Like I'm big into apologetics. I love reason. I love reasoning. Paul reasoned in the synagogues. I love all of that stuff. Do you know what captivated me? What changed my life? It wasn't because someone argued me into the kingdom. It was because I had an encounter with the living God. And when I had an encounter with the living God, then all of a sudden stuff started to make sense and reason became wisdom. And this is our job. Think of what's going on in our world in the last week even. Like we can argue, we can reason, we can logic, we can debate, we can do all of those things and all of it's good. But fundamentally, if the goal is to win an argument, we've missed the point. The goal is to bring people to Christ. Let Christ captivate and capture them. And as they see Christ for who He is and what He's done in all His glory, then all of a sudden, things change. Then instead of us just trying to win arguments, we're bringing wisdom. And it's not my wisdom that's gonna change anybody. It's only the very presence of God. God is the one who brings transformation. God is the one who brings change. Our job as a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit is to bring His presence to people that they might encounter that presence and have their lives transformed. That is, the, that is what we're here for. It's not just to reason with people, it's that people might have a revelation so that the reason makes sense. Because you can know everything. Pharisees, far out, how much did they know? They knew everything there was to know, but they'd had no revelation and so their lives weren't changed. Paul knew everything, but the moment he had a revelation of God on that road, everything changed and it all made sense. And then he was able to bring, and as as Lee quoted it before, that verse had been on my heart. He didn't come with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. It's not saying he wasn't smart and that he wasn't logical and he wasn't a great uh, uh, argument or a debater. No, he had all of those things going on, but it was the power of God, the presence of God that brought change in people's lives. That's what we exist for to see the presence of God manifest in people's lives, to draw people to that place and let Him do the transforming work in people's lives. Amen. We are a presence movement first and foremost. Number two, here's what it means. It means that there's still an altar. There's still an altar. Romans 12, 1. Romans 12.1 is a fairly significant verse that people don't like to talk about very much in the world today. But let's let's go there because it will be helpful. I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, pattern, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable and perfect. There is still an altar. We don't bypass the altar. We still come to the altar. And what we do is because we've caught a hold of who Christ is, because He's captured us, When we come to the altar, we realise that actually I have to lay my life down on this thing. Pick up your cross and follow me. Not pick up your cause and follow me. Or some of you didn't hear that and you need to hear that. Pick up your cross and follow me, not pick up your cause and follow me. Because the cause will flow out of the cross revelation. 
And so we come to the altar. We lay our lives down on the altar. Guess what? It means it's not about me. It means it's not about what I want. It means it's not about my desires. It means it's about none of that. It's about acknowledging that the God of the universe has made a way. And there's stuff that every single person here struggles with because none of us are perfect. But I don't get to tell God what is right and what is wrong. I don't get to come before a holy God and say, well, you say that, but actually I know better. And so I'm gonna do it this way because my society and culture is telling me that this is now the new social norm. No, no, I bring all of it and I lay it on the altar and I say, have your way in my life. And my life will be laid down before you. And I'm gonna trust you by your power and your might and your glory to come in and strengthen me for the walk ahead. But my life will be a living sacrifice. I don't have to stay there. I don't have to, I'm not, I'm not dead and buried. The old self is dead and buried, but because of what Christ has done, I am raised to life with Him. The new creation, behold, the old is gone, the new has come. We're supposed to be made new and the way we're made new is by laying our lives on the altar. Because there's a pattern by which we access the presence. So we die to self and we know that's a lifelong journey of dying to self. Repentance isn't a one-off thing, it's a lifestyle because I don't know about you, anyone else here perfect? Neither am I. (laughs) So I'm constantly having to come here and guess you are too. Oh, I gotta die to that, I gotta die to that. I put it here. Lord, have your way in my life, have your way in my life, have your way in my life knowing that in Christ, I am being transformed by the renewing of my mind. He is, he is, I am being conformed to the image of His likeness. But it's only as we come to the altar. There is still an altar. Last point, band, you can come up and we're gonna close this out. But here's the last point that I love from this Hebrews passage is that the corporate is still important. Let's read it again. Look, therefore, so in light of all of this this pattern, we have confidence to enter the holy places. How? By the blood of Jesus, the new and living way that is His flesh, because we have a great high priest over the house of God. So let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with the pure water, that basin. Let us hold fast to that confession of hope without wavering for He who promised is faithful. Now watch this, verse 24, look at me, concentrate. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together, some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as the day draws near. The corporate is still important. By corporate, I don't mean business. Some of you hear corporate and you straight away, you think of a business lunch with a shirt and tie. Corporate means the gathering, it means public. Because the pattern hasn't changed, but the access has, God's heart is for a people and the gathering is still important. The corporate gathering is still vital to the worship of God. It's why we gather here on a Sunday. It's why we gather in life groups. It's why we gather for prayer meetings. It's why like to the church, the corporate is important. It's a part of God's pattern, why? Why does it matter? If I can access the presence of God through Christ, if the Holy Spirit is at work in the world and in my life, why does it matter if I meet with anybody else? Can't I just do church by myself on a beach? Can't I just be the church on the beach? Can't I just love God wherever I am? Yes, you can. Absolutely you can. But the corporate matters because this is the shift we have to catch. This is the shift. The Western church, stay with me for two minutes. The Western church must catch this reality of Scripture. We must understand in the pattern of God that the corporate gathering is not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about me coming to consume. 
It is about the body and the fact that when we gather, I have something to give. The corporate is not about me getting, it's about me giving. Because by me coming, I will encourage someone in the faith. You might be here right now and it might just be noise and you're getting nothing from it, but you may well have a conversation after this with the person next to you that they desperately need to hear, that they desperately need to be encouraged in. And that's why you are here. We come to encourage one another, to build one another up in the most holy faith. It is a body. And when the body's missing a part, something's wrong. Yeah, anyone had a broken arm before? I remember I broke my collarbone back in the day and who would have thought such a tiny bone would have such an impact on the whole body? I couldn't even get up. I'm lying in bed and I was like, surely I can, it's just a collarbone, like surely I can just do this. But I couldn't. I needed someone to put their hand behind my head, their hand behind my shoulder, say one, two, three. And then I could get up because that little bone impacts everything. It's true for the church. The body of Christ, every part impacts the next part. We are called to journey together, to encourage one another, to build one another up. And when we don't come to the gathering, yeah, you miss out on what someone could encourage you in, but also they miss out on what you could be encouraging them in. And so we have this altar I lay my life on this altar, but I bring my gift to the altar. I bring what I have. And some of you are sitting here and you're like, well, I've got nothing to bring, Dave, just broken bones and a messy life. Don't you think that's valuable in the heart of God? Don't you think God can take brokenness and bring beauty? Don't you think that God maybe wants to use your brokenness to impact the life of someone else who's got some broken and bruised bits as well? Maybe you've got some gifts and there's a lack and just maybe by you saying, hey, this is what I have, it's not that much. It's a couple of loaves and a few fish. That's all it is, not that impressive, but just maybe in Christ's hands, it's enough to feed 5,000 people. Just maybe it's exactly what He needs in that moment to do a miracle in somebody else's life, which will have eternal, everlasting, transformative impact. And just maybe a day will come when you're standing in glory before God and that person comes before the living God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and they lay their crown down at His feet and they worship Him and they turn to you and say, thank you, I'm here because you said something because you fed me when I was down and out, because you came and you cleaned my laundry when I had nothing else to give. I'm here because God used you to be a vessel through which His Spirit grabbed me, captivated me, revealed Christ to me, changed my life forever and led me on a path everlasting. That's why in going through the pattern of the temple, the author of Hebrews says, don't give up meeting together. It's not so the pastors 2000 years later could be worried about church attendance and giving. I don't care about church attendance and giving. What I care about is people walking with Christ and walking in the fullness of all that He has for them. And a part of that is joining together. So don't give up meeting together. The corporate is important. It matters to God. It's a part of His plan. It's a part of His pattern. It's a part of His purpose in bringing His transformative power to the earth. We're called to be a presence people, church. How good that He has made a way. May we be a church that enters in, that draws near to God with a full assurance of faith. You can stand to your feet.
In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says this, Since then we have a great High Priest, the pattern, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a High Priest who is unable to sympathise with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then, listen, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Because He has fulfilled it, we enter into it. And we come with confidence because it's not about our works and our righteousness. It's not about, are you worthy of entering? It's about He is worthy and I am in Him and therefore I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Those of you who have been around this church for a while, we've been at this for a few years now, you would know that probably a fortnight doesn't go past without me quoting this passage. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him, endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinful men that you will not grow weary and not lose heart. That is why we are here, to draw people to Christ. That's it. Come to Jesus. It's all about Him. It's all about Him. And everything we do is about trying to create that pattern to be that dwelling place on the earth, to be that church He's called us to be, to point people to that. And a part of that is what we're about to do right now, which is celebrate this ancient practice we call communion. And this is an ordinance that Jesus gave us so that we would not forget that it's about Him and would not forget that He laid His life on the altar so we could come through the altar, through the curtain that is His body into that holy place and dwell with God forever in the Eden ideal. And so what we do is we come and we take the bread or the wafer. And as we take that wafer, we say, this is, He says, this is my body. Eat this in remembrance of me. And so as we take that, we remember His, blood, His body broken for us. And then He has a cup and He says, drink this. And again, He says, do this whenever you gather in remembrance of me. So we take that cup and we, we're reminded that His blood was shed for us, that He fulfilled the biblical pattern so that the purpose could be achieved, that we could enter in. And so as we take communion today, draw near to God with a full assurance of that finished work, yes? Don't come doubting. Come today and, and take that body and take that blood and come with assurance of faith. You don't have to do it. He has done it. It's finished. You just come and lay your life down and receive His life. That's why we celebrate. He has done it. He has done it. He is Lord. He is risen. He is glorious and mighty. He is God dwelling with humanity by His Spirit to restore the Eden ideal of creation. So take it with confidence and celebrate Him and rejoice in all that He has done. And as we do that, the band will play and we'll sing and we'll worship Him. And we'll leave this dwelling place with such celebration that my sins are atoned for and I have been set free. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Your goodness. Thank You for Your mercy. Thank You for Your wonders. We love You. Father, we pray right now that You would just reveal Yourself to us more and more. I ask if there's anyone here who maybe has been involved in church for a long time, 
but has never seen You rightly, Lord. Open their eyes to see Jesus. Loving, glorious, beautiful Jesus. Thank You that You dwell with us. May our lives become that living sacrifice, that dwelling place where we take Your glorious presence to those who so desperately need to hear it. We love You, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus.